Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for giving us all wisdom, Father, for abounding toward us in the fullness of your revelation, Father, that we might know you even as we also are known, that we might know you face to face in the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that that you would open our eyes to know you to know all that you have in store for us, all that you have done for us, and all that you do do through us. And Father, I pray that as we fellowship together, look into your word together, pray together, sing together, Lord, that you might teach us what it is to be a member of your body and a recipient of your grace. We thank you, Father, for all these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians and chapter 1. Let's begin reading in verse 17, where Paul prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power. All right, now we have been talking about this passage and going through it in the last couple few weeks. We've talked about that spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, and we've seen that what that what that is, what that is through the Bible, is that in the various times and, and ages and dispensations and under the the various stages of the purpose of God as he fulfills that through his people over time, that God recognizes the willing. And he imparts them, those who, who have a willing heart, to, uh, as we've been talking about, show up for the work. That God imparts them with the, with the knowledge, the understanding, and the ability to do, to carry out, to perform uh, God's purpose, to, to participate in what God is doing. What God's looking for is a willing heart who, who's, uh, as, as the, uh, the guys, uh, that I can't remember their names now, the, the, the fellows, the gentlemen, the saints back there with Moses, whose job it was to build the tabernacle. God told Moses, he gave Moses a pattern by which to build that tabernacle, and then he picked out the men whose, it says, their hearts moved them to the work. And their hearts moved them to do the work. God filled them with the spirit of wisdom and of understanding to know how to, how to, how to embroider all those curtains and how to make uh, that lamp stand and, and exactly how to construct that table and, and to make everything exactly the way to work the purpose of God the way God wants it work. So that's that spirit of wisdom and revelation that God that God gives. Paul tells the Philippians, it's God, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, because it's God that worketh in you, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. So if you've got the heart, say, Lord, I'm saved. Thank you for saving me. Now I want to work out my salvation. Well, then God will work in you 
to perform, to will, and to do of his good pleasure. So that's what Paul is praying for these Ephesians when he says, I pray that God would give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, to be able to understand his word, to not just know in your head his purpose, but to internalize that and to actually fulfill it. And that spirit and wisdom of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And that's what we're we're striving for, we're aiming for, we're pressing toward is to know God, to know him better. Now there is a a definite dispensational aspect and and necessity to that. You cannot know God as he would like for you to know him if you don't know what he's doing, what he wishes, wills to do with you, what he's doing in the day that you live, in the day that you work and and serve. If you don't understand what God is doing, then there is uh, that there is a a a schism, a gap, a, a, a gulf between that spirit of wisdom and revelation and you. The bridge between those things is that is that revelation, to understand the revelation that you're given. And we, we've seen, come with me to, um, I'll tell you what, look at, look at Deuteronomy chapter 5. We talked last week... Deuteronomy chapter 5. We talked last week about, we were in 1 Corinthians 13, and Paul talks about seeing face to face. And we saw that what that means is not, Paul is not talking about when we get to heaven and, and see God face to face. That is not what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 13 there. He's talking about a full revelation. He's talking about seeing God clearly. He's talking about understanding everything that 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 God has for us to know to un, and to understand and again to internalize. And he says now we know in part then we shall know even as also we are known. And that's what that's what God is looking for. He wants us to know him the way he knows us. Now you say, well, God knows us fully and, and, and throughly, and there's no way we're ever going to know him to the extent like, to, that he knows us. But see, the, what Paul's talking about there, to know God as you also are known, is to know him face to face. To have that full revelation. There is nothing kept back. There is nothing hidden. He hasn't. He has revealed his his mind to you. See, that's how that's how you get to know anybody. Think of your your family, your your closest friends. I mean, how do you how do you know them? But that they have revealed themselves to you, and it's those people that you reveal yourself fully to. You have acquaintances, they don't know everything about you like, like your family does, like your closest friends do. They know your name, they know a thing or two, what do you do, you know, that kind of thing. But the people you love, they know you because you, because you let them know you. God has revealed, he has opened himself up to us for that reason. And you know, when you have a good friend or whoever it is, and you have, you, you believe that you have uh, opened yourself up to them over, the, over time, and then they say something or do something, you ever say to somebody, you don't know me at all, do you? <laughs> it's kind of disappointing. It's like, I thought you knew me better than that, don't, don't, you know? 
So God has revealed himself to us, and he wants us to know him. Now, here in Deuteronomy chapter 5, we saw when we talked about, I know, we'll get to the Bible in a second here, I'm sorry. We talked about that face to face, and we saw how Moses talked to God face to face, and yet never saw his face. So it's not about standing before God and, and looking, it's, it's about the revelation. And, and that uh, God spoke to Moses apparently. He tells Aaron and, and uh, Miriam, he says, most prophets, he says, I'll talk to them in a, in a dark vision and in a, in a dream. That's why Paul says, before the Bible was done, now we see through a glass darkly. That's what he was talking about. That he, he says, but Moses, Moses is not so. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently. That's in Numbers 12. We looked at that last week. So that's what mouth to mouth, face to face, that's what that means. Even apparently. Nothing hidden, open, clear. Communication. So, okay, so Moses was, uh, <clears throat> he was privileged in that way, right? But look here in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Now Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep and do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. Now we're going to come back to this passage in uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, but Look there in, in verse 3, and this is incidental to why we're here, but the stress that Moses puts on what God is doing today and who you are and where you are in the program of God. He says, God, he, again in verse 1, he made this, I speak in your ears this day. So that's today, that's but now that you may learn them and keep and do them. So this covenant, these statutes, this is what God's doing today, and this is what God has for you this day. In the but now for Israel here. And the Lord our God made a covenant with us, with who? With us, in Horeb, with us being Israel. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers. Now that's time past. What Moses is saying here is look at what God's doing today and notice, note, understand, and, and make a point of knowing that God didn't do this in time past. He's working differently today. And when you go back in the scripture in time past, which for them would be the book of Genesis, you understand that God is working differently and you can't go back there to know what God is doing today. You got to know what God is doing this day. And he says, God made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. He's kind of over exaggerating the point here. Far more, I think, than Paul ever does. The, the, the importance of knowing your butt now and living in it, and what God wants from you today. Now that's important. It's critical in the context of what we're talking about. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Verse 4. The Lord talked with you face to face, in the mount, out of the midst of the fire. And I stood between the Lord and you at that time to show you the word of the Lord, for ye were afraid by reason of the fire and went not up into the mount. See, God, it wasn't just Moses that God spoke with face to face. When, when th this dispensation began at the giving of the law, God spoke with that whole nation, Moses says, face to face. He spoke clearly. They heard his voice. But they 
he says you were afraid. You couldn't you couldn't handle that face to face relationship with God. So Moses had to get between. They said Moses, you you go you 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 go know God and then come back and tell us what we need to know. See. How many, how many Christians do that today? I know, I know you all don't. But you know, trying to get trying to get Christian people outside of this assembly, just out in life. It's been my experience that trying to get Christian people involved just in a Bible study. Hey, you want to stop by? You want to do? You know, maybe get a Bible study going. It's like it's like pulling teeth. They're they're looking at you, going, you know, "What are you What are you talking about? You go know God. I got better things to do." Now these, you know, I mean, okay, I'm standing in front of a mountain that's shaking and burning with fire, and God's the, all right. I I guess I'd be a little scared too. But but God wants to make Himself known to you. And you don't want to be like those like those children of Israel that don't have that heart to show up. You go show up and then tell us, you know, tell us what you heard. So now that that the, yeah. Come with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and, and see what Paul says about that because, again, there is a dispensational import to, to what we're talking about here. There in, in 1 Corinthians 13, where we were last week, we're in 2 Corinthians 3 now, where Paul's talking about face-to-face and, and seeing God, knowing God face-to-face. He talks about it in the context of tongues and the gifts and the healings and things going away. And what he's saying there is that that God is giving you right now, the Corinthians, right now being before when he wrote the epistle before the Bible was done, before the revelation was complete, right now God is giving you what you need to perform what he wants you to do right now. Once that revelation is complete, what you need to do, what God is calling you to do, is going to change. And and this prophecy and these tongues and, and all of these things are, are no longer going to be needed. Therefore, God is no longer going to be working those things because God works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And when... When his operating principle changes, then he's not working that anymore. He's going to be working something different. And you want to know what the something different is. And Paul says what, what, what you got now is you got faith and hope and charity. And that's the operating principle now. Faith, hope, and love. And it's that that God is working in you to perform, to to do his good pleasure. Now, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, First Corinthians chapter 3, uh, yeah, we better get all the way from uh, verse 6. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 6. Who also, God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now we're talking, he's talking about the Old Testament versus the New. And in the New Testament, in general, across the board, has to do with that indwelling with the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, as opposed to the external carnal law of commandments. God living within his people now. And he calls the Old Testament then, the letter, he says, the letter killeth, 
but the Spirit giveth life. And what we've been talking about pretty much throughout this study in, in, in Ephesians, in this first chapter, is our sonship. And our sonship, our adoption, has to do with the res- that resurrection, the day of the redemption of our body. That's where the hope of faith, hope, and charity comes in. And that, that life, that resurrection, eternal life, the power of that, Hebrew says that the Lord Jesus Christ was made a priest after the power of an endless life. And the power of that life, not like Adam received, where he could die, but like we receive by resurrection, by being a new creature, resurrected in the image of, of, of God, in the image of Jesus Christ. That life is what it is to know God. What, is it, what does it mean to know God, to, be, to, to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him? God is life. God is life and God gives life. Paul calls the Lord Jesus Christ the only one that has immortality. That is, he is the only giver, the one who is able to give immortality. And it is, if you don't understand the resurrection and the hope that comes with that resurrection for you and me, that heavenly hope that that reconciles not just you and me to God, but all things, the universe, all things are reconciled to God by the power that works in you. If you don't understand that, if you don't know that, you don't know God. Paul, again, we'll get to the passage here. Paul tells these Corinthians just a few pages back in, in 1 Corinthians 15. They're, they're arguing at Corinth whether there's a resurrection or not. They're calling themselves Christians and they're arguing about whether there's a resurrection. And Paul says, some of you have not the knowledge of God. Those people who are denying the resurrection. He says, I speak this to your shame. You don't know God. You want to know God? That's how you know God. You know God as the giver, possessor, creator, originator of life. You want to, you... Now we've got to get to know what life means, but before we can do that, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, moving on here. So that old covenant... That le- the letter killeth, not because God wants to kill people, but because his righteousness is unattainable by us in our sinful state. But the Spirit is the, is, is the solution to that. The Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and graven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel, now this is, we're getting here, could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Now that's talking about when Moses, they, God spoke to them face to face. They didn't want it. They told Moses, you go talk to God. Moses went and talked to God. And when he came back, they couldn't look at him because his face was shining with the glory that they should have received but refused. So Moses got it. And he came back and they said they didn't want to look at him either. So he had to put a cloth, he had to put a veil over his face. We don't even want to see it second hand. Now look, this is just after they came through the Red Sea. 
and saw the power and salvation of God. And still, you know, people use the excuse today, you know, if God just made himself more obvious, how come he's not, you know, even if he doesn't appear in the sky, at least he could do a miracle or two and, you know, uh, maybe show us his uh, some proof of his existence. Well, that nation saw some proof of God's existence and they didn't want it. And just because God's talking in a smaller, stiller voice today, number one, doesn't mean he's any less serious. And number two, that's no excuse. God, you know, he's not obvious enough. Well, he's been obvious in the past and people didn't want him then either. So you got to think to yourself, okay, if I was there then, that's what I would have done. Too obvious, God. Now I'm here now, not obvious enough. Well, it might be time to do some introspection and say, why am I really? Why do I really not have time to get to know God? So they couldn't steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. So that glory that Israel couldn't even look at, that was that was temporary. If that's true, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So now, what Israel couldn't stand to look at, you and I, the, the, the glory is far greater. For if the ministration of condemnation, it's like the, the ministration of death, the ministration of condemnation, now understand that all those, the, the reason for all those things, the, the law, Paul says, was weak through the flesh. Is it, it was our problem, not God's problem. Why? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when you see the glory of God, you can't, you can't take it. But you're under grace. See, that's why you need to know where you are today and how God works today. And I know we all know that in our heads, but then we go out there and, and we got that little voice in our, in our mind as we do, as we go through our day and the things that we do and the things that we don't do and the, and, and all in the, in the law, that law in our mind is always trying to, trying to beat us down and you want to get to know God. You want to get to know God as the giver of life, not as the one who is beating you over the head. You want to get to know the God of grace. What God is doing, what he's trying to do with you today, faith, hope, and love. You want to get to know God so he can work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Verse 10, For even that which was made glorious, the old covenant, had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. So not only is our dispensation more glorious than the old dispensation, Paul says, by comparison, the old, it's, it's like the sun and the moon. You go out at night and the moon is full and it's shining bright. You can't even hardly look at it for too long. Then the sun comes out. You can't even see the moon anymore. The moon has no glory. That great light that God set in the sky, glorious until the greater light comes out. You and I, we're living in the greater light. Do you know that? Do you live in that? God is the giver of life. Your life. Even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth 
is glorious. And that takes us back to that to that passage in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, talking about that which is done away and that which remaineth. Prophecy and tongues and all that kind of thing is done away and now abideth faith, hope, and charity. What remains is the greater glory. And all of that tongues talking and prophesying and all of that kind of thing that people like to like to glory in. Paul says, Why 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 are you why are you clinging to those weak and beggarly elements. It's, it, it, it's grace. That's where the glory is. Faith, hope, charity. Seeing then, verse 12, that we have such hope. Now Paul's talking about hope now. All of a sudden, and really not all of a sudden, because all of that glory in the previous verses, he's, he's, he's talking about our hope. He's talking about our resurrection. He's talking about our adoption. He's talking about the full realization of our sonship. He's talking about our life. Our life. Our life is eternal. This life ends. That life doesn't end. God is the giver of life. We need to know him that way now. The God that gives us that, that hope, that glory, that that resurrection, that that life is the God who wants to work that life in you now. That's life. And you have it. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. See, what that glory that was shining from Moses' face, that glory that God wanted to show them, the glory of the law. What is the end? They couldn't see it. it that glory is the, is the glory of the end of the law. You know what Paul says? Who Paul says is the end of the law? Who is the end of the law? Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all them that believe. They could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. They couldn't see Christ. They couldn't see Jesus Christ. That's the glory of the law that was that was hidden from them under that under that veil. You now you say, okay, Jesus Christ, he's, you know, obviously he's a great person and he is our God and all the rest. But the point is that he's your life. He's your life. Do you know Jesus? We're all Christians here this morning. Yeah, we know Jesus. Is he your life? You know what else what else he is? He's your hope. See, to know Jesus Christ is not just to know to know the man, not just to know that God was manifest in the flesh, and not just to know that he came and died for your sins, but to have himself, to know him, to have him revealed in you, to internalize that revelation, that full revelation of God in in you, living in you, that life of God. Remember we saw last week that when Paul prays for, for the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened, we saw that those, those the heathen, he says, Paul says, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. 
through the ignorance that is in them. What was the problem with us before we were saved? What was the problem with those heathen back there in the, at, the, at the Tower of Babel? It's the problem with Israel having fallen. All of it is the same problem. They're alienated from the life of God. They don't know God. Because they don't know God, they don't have life. You've come to know God, therefore you have life. Now you want to get to know God so that you can live life. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. So Paul says, that's not us. We're not like that. We don't have, that. there is no veil. We can steadfastly look. But their minds were blinded. For until their minds were blinded, that's why Paul says that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. Their understanding was darkened. And their minds were blinded back then, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Romans chapter 11. Paul says the nation, that nation of Israel was cast away and, and because the, the prophecy said that God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear unto this day. God gave them a spirit of slumber. Why? Because they didn't have that heart willing to show up. So God, who wanted to give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the eyes of their understanding being enlightened, instead he gave them the spirit of slumber. Put them to sleep and gave them blindness. Now it's our turn again. Those heathen back there in 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 at the Tower of Babel and and before the flood and all those guys that Paul talks about that were vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. And when they knew God, they didn't want to retain him in their knowledge and they didn't glorify him as God. And all of those, all of those things, those heathen, those heathen are us. And we've got a second chance here. It's our time again. It was their time. God was trying to reveal himself to them. They knew God, but they didn't like to retain him in their knowledge. They had no time to, to, to get to know God. So God gave them up unto vile affections and all those things there in Romans chapter 1. That's those heathen back there that Paul tells the Ephesians, don't walk like other Gentiles walk. Don't walk like those people back there. So God cast them off. He wanted to give them light. They didn't want the light He casts them off. He calls out Abraham and he creates this nation from Abraham and he tries to give them light to talk to them face to face and they didn't want it. So finally, he gives them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and puts them to sleep and casts them away and voila, here we are. We're back. (laughs) We're back. And and for you and me, now the world is doing the same thing that those guys back there in, in Genesis did. But for you and me, that's not... This, this world, by the glory of the cross, this world is crucified unto me, and I am crucified unto it. And I live a different life. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a different, that's a different life. You want to know God because you want to know what life is. So now we got these Gentiles out here again, just like you had back there at Babel. And all of the stuff there in Romans chapter 1 and other places that, that talk about the result of a culture like that. The fallenness, the brokenness, the, 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 the bondage of it. 
And then you got the body of Christ. That's all. You got unsaved people and you got the body of Christ. Praise God, you're on the good side of that of that equation. But what you want to do is you want to live as a member of the body of Christ. And and I'm not talking about necessarily your behavior and, and stop doing bad stuff and start doing good stuff. Do that. But that's not really even what we're talking about here. We're talking about life. Living, walking in life rather than walking in death. Walking in liberty rather than walking in bondage. Bondage to what? Bondage to anything. Bondage, bondage to sin. Bondage to the world. Bondage to, to the law. Bondage to your own mental machinations and all the things that 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 our minds and our emotions and our in our in our in our baggage try to chain us to. All of those things. Watch what Paul says here. He says, their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, it being their heart, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is that spirit, that ministration of the spirit rather than the letter, the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. See? Liberty. That's what we're talking about here. You know, Paul he, Paul tells the Romans, he says in Romans chapter 8, that God, he's talking about the adoption, and he says, God hath not given us the spirit of bondage again to fear. But he's given us the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So that's that's a dispensational thing. He hasn't given us the spirit of bondage again. That's the law, to fear. But he's given us this spirit of adoption, this spirit of life. So that's Old Testament, New Testament. That's dispensational, rightly dividing the word, all of that. But he tells Timothy, he says, Timothy, I'm, Timothy's out there. He's trying to do the work. And and Paul and, and, and he's having a hard time of it. And Paul says, Timothy, I'm mindful of your tears. And and Timothy's struggling to 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 live this life and to do the service that he's called to do. And Paul says, Timothy, I want you to stir up the gift that's in you by the Holy Ghost that was given to you. Because God has not given to us the spirit of fear. Now, that's what he told the Romans. God has not given us the spirit of bondage again to fear. That's a dispensational issue. But he brings that up to Timothy and he says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. See, that dispensational understanding that you have, it's not just knowledge. You know, you can live if you understand what God is doing today and your part in it and, and, and your participation in this program of life. That you can live a life of power and of love and of a sound mind. That means you know that little voice in the back of your head means you know better than he does. You can be free. See, that, that spirit of bondage, that's, that's one choice. You can, be, you can do that. Or you can live that life of power and of love and of a sound mind. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's life. It's liberty. It's freedom. But we all, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, no veil, face to face, 
Beholding as in a glass. Now here's the thing. Beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So now what happened here? We're getting to know God. And we're seeing, now we're seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see that in chapter 4, verse 6. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. But the, 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 the thing about this passage here in 1 Corinthians 3, while we're getting to know God, Paul says we're, we're looking into the mirror, into the glass of God's Word. God's Word is a mirror. The Old Covenant was a mirror, and it told you how rotten you were so that you could get to the end of the Old Covenant, which is Jesus Christ, life. So then you say, yes, I want that. Because this is killing me. And that's going to give me life. So you go over and you, and you get with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you're looking in the mirror of God's word and you see something different. It's not that, that, that mirror isn't showing you ugliness anymore. It's not showing you this, this horrible thing. Isaiah looks at that nation and he says, you're filled with wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. That's what the law, that's what the mirror of the law showed. That's not what the mirror of grace shows. We look into that glass and we see the glory of the Lord. We see the glory of God. Paul tells the Romans back there in Romans chapter 3, he says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's our problem. We were alienated. Here's the glory of God. Here's us. Our sin doesn't let us get there. And that gap is that alienation from the life of God. That gap's not there anymore. Under grace. Now we look in the mirror of God's word and we see the glory of God in that mirror. We don't fall short from that anymore. We've got life now. We'll have to leave it there.